Welcome everyone to the Public Health Not Public Drinking press conference. You can join the Spanish translation directly for the event. I am Bruce Lee Livingston, Executive Director and CEO of Alcohol Justice, the alcohol industry watchdog. I will be the MC for today's half hour press conference. We are community and public health advocates united across America to ask that deregulation of alcohol sales be repealed as soon as possible and that alcohol and bar de uh, deregulation not become the new normal. Alcohol and the COVID pandemic do not mix. This Zoom webinar based press conference is open by registration to the press and speakers, but every word and image is simultaneously playing live on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Members of the media may directly pose questions to me in the Q&A comment area, and I will refer them to panelists. Members of the public may discuss and debate with us live on fa Facebook and on Twitter. The public in every state can take action now with their governor by texting to the number 313131 and entering the word regulate. That's 313131 and entering the word regulate. To start off, let's look at the negative effects of not taking bars seriously during the time of the COVID pandemic in this video clip from CNN. All tested positive for coronavirus. No, nobody had masks. It was crowded in there, just like a normal bar. Um, why did you think it was okay to do it that way? And what do you think now? I think at the time it was more out of sight, out of mind. We hadn't known anybody who had it personally. Um, Governor, mayor, everybody says it's fine. We go out, it's a friend's birthday. It was a mistake. How do you I'm feel about it now? You say it's a mistake. What do you want people to think? I feel foolish, it, it's too soon. Clearly it's, you know, we got super sick almost immediately within days. So I just, I feel Hey look, the most effective preacher is a convert. Now you can tell people, I know why you think it's not a big deal. Uh, learn from me, at least from now. Thank you for coming forward and doing this. That's powerful stuff. Our first speaker today is Dr. Jason Wilson, an emergency medicine physician at Tampa General Hospital. Dr. Wilson. This is a very important issue, and I really appreciate you having me today. You know, what we've seen during COVID is that uh, alcohol use in social bar situations has really had the ability to massively move where the direction we were heading in the epidemic. So as soon as we were able to get things under control in our area, in the Tampa area, um, we reopened bars. And what we saw from that was a very quick, accelerated, exponential climb in cases. Uh, of course, the problem with bars is that you have disinhibition uh, and then you have every other major risk factor for COVID all taking place at the same time. Tight indoor space, uh, people becoming inebriated, uh, less inhibited, getting close together, talking loudly. And what we've seen from that are super spreader events. So if you go back to May or June in this area, we were getting things under control. We opened up bars early. We saw a number of super spreader events that were directly traced those bars. We saw uh, infection of hundreds of people, probably from just a few different places in a few different evenings. This is a critical issue right now. We have to be very cognizant of that. If we want to get COVID under control in this country, we have to pay attention to what's going on with alcohol use. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Um, that's a very important message. Our next speaker is Jean-Philippe Dorval, also known as JP. He's the advocacy and policy liaison at Prevention Action Alliance in Columbus, Ohio. Awesome, uh, thanks for the introduction, Bruce. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. So in Ohio, we are currently facing a series of legislative proposals that would result in massive long-lasting deregulation of alcohol policies across the board. These proposals would extend sales hours for alcoholic beverages from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. on Saturday and Sunday, expand alcohol sales to 24 hours through local elections, allow alcohol sales on Sunday across the state, preempting voters' rights, 
codify to-go sales without a meal purchase or drink limits, codify alcohol delivery directly to consumers through third-party vendors, remove $5.8 million of permit revenue, taking money away from alcohol regulation, local governments, and substance use prevention and treatment services. Relax regulations around Ohio's outdoor refreshment areas, taking regulatory power away from local governments, allow social media advertising for alcohol products with no consumer protection safeguards in place. In Ohio, we're seeing a surge of behavioral health issues, overdose deaths, suicides, and texts to the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services crisis text line. Considering these struggles, the last thing our state should do is increase access to a substance that is known to be used as a harmful coping mechanism to the uncertainty, pain, and struggle brought on by this pandemic. We understand the financial difficulty our state is facing, what the nation is facing, but deregulating alcohol will only cause more problems now and down the road. I urge Governor DeWine, the governor of Ohio, and our legislature to look at these proposals through a public health lens and to act with the, he with the health and safety of Ohio citizens in their decision-making process. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, thank you very much, Jean-Philippe Dorval. Um, let's hear now from Linda Bosma, PhD, a professional prevention program evaluator representing Minnesota Concerns. Good morning. Thank you, Bruce. And thank you, everyone who's joined us this morning for this important press conference. I work with coalitions in Minnesota and around the country that have worked for years to protect and reduce, prevent and reduce alcohol-related problems. We know that sound policies that regulate the sale and service of alcohol are the most effective way to reduce overconsumption and to prevent sales to underage persons. Regulations such as those that prohibit home delivery, restrict takeout and to-go drink service, and responsible beverage server training are just some of the sound policies that have helped reduce consumption, especially among young people in Minnesota and throughout the U.S. Like your states, Minnesota's bars and restaurants and the many servers and sellers they employ are suffering economically under COVID-19 restrictions. And like most states, Minnesota has relaxed regulations to help small businesses. But reopening has come with some challenges. In July in Minnesota, nearly 1,000 COVID-19 cases were connected to just four bars after reopening. Let me be clear, we are not anti-business. Like everyone else, we want to return to socializing and celebrating and supporting our local businesses. But as communities get bartenders and servers back to work and businesses reopened, we must be sure that addressing economic problems is not done at the cost of increased alcohol abuse and addiction in our communities. First, alcohol deregulation cannot become the new normal. Second, we know regulating alcohol service saves lives and reduces alcohol-related harm. So relaxed measures must be temporary. And finally, as businesses reopen, they must have sound COVID prevention plans in place to prevent the spread and address any positive cases quickly. Bars and restaurants are an important part of our communities. And as part of the community, we all need to be sure they are protecting the community's members. Reopen safe, smart, and make decisions informed by public health. Thank you. Thank you, Linda Bosma from Minnesota. We are proud to hear from Thomas Greenfield, PhD. He's the scientific director and senior scientist at the Alcohol Research Group in Smoky Emeryville, California. Hello, Tom. Hi. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, and very briefly, uh, I just want to reiterate some of the important messages. A significant number of states, among them California, Texas, Florida, Colorado, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, and Louisiana, for economic reasons not guided by science, open bars before the COVID-19 case rates had dropped sufficiently. That is before the pandemic had been brought under control in their communities and states. And before, um, you know, testing and tracing had really been put in place. As public health un understands, bar openings where people congregate, socialize, often without masks and social distancing. And as was noted, speaking loudly, 
are hotspots for the new COVID-19 spreading events. Furthering the pandemic, we must not make this mistake again in prim by premature openings. Uh, in addition, the creep of bars into outdoor spaces around bar bars such as parking lots and sidewalks brings with it its own public health risks through increased availability. Together with other regulatory relief in the alcohol sector, such as cocktails to go, regulations should not become permanent as others have noted. We know from numerous rigorous studies that increased availability leads to increased drinking and increased alcohol-related mental health and domestic violence problems. Cocktails to go involves unsealed containers and can be opened in cars, as well as leading to greater access to youth. Special interests are pushing for these regulatory relaxations to become the new normal. And this raises serious public health concerns and is not supported by the science. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Greenfield. Now let's hear from Gilbert Mora. He's the prevention coordinator at Behavioral Health Services in Hollywood, California, representing the California Alcohol Policy Alliance, or CAPA. Hi, Gilbert. Uh, good morning. Uh, like Bruce said, my name is Gilbert Mora. I am the co-chair of the California Alcohol Policy Alliance. In California, Governor Gavin Newsom failed in his COVID-19 response by making alcohol sales essential. Alcohol deregulation in California has taken the form of regulatory relief measures impl implemented by the state's Alcohol Beverage Control Department. These measures allow alcohol establishments to continue operation in the middle of a global pandemic. Some of the so-called regulatory relief measures include to-go cocktails, home alcohol delivery, expansion of dining areas into sidewalks and streets to serve alcohol, and the sale of unused alcohol licenses. In California less than a month ago, the Alcohol Beverage Control Department explicitly stated that public safety and economic development are our first priority. However, is it not also their responsibility to protect the public, especially in this time of COVID-19? Even after public health concerns were brought to our attention of the Alcohol Beverage Control Department, they failed to take action. Even after the department admitted to a violation rate of over 50% by delivery services, no appropriate corrective actions were taken. We're not even sure if the California Alcohol Beverage Control consulted the California Department of Public Health in a meaningful way when formulating these regulatory relief measures. In California, the Alcohol Beverage Control Department is primary a law enforcement agency but by its regulatory actions, and more telling by its inactions, you would believe that it is instead an alcohol promotion and economic development department. ABC rarely denies alcohol licenses and in fact has continued to social, contributed to social, racial, and health inequities by allowing alcohol over concentration in historically disadvantaged communities. These inequities, are currently contributing to the increase in COVID-19 cases among people of color who are the essential workers in the industry. This compounded by the lack of interest from the California Department of Public Health to address alcohol harms in the time of COVID-19 is particularly alarming. It is clear that there's no scientific basis behind the formulation of these so-called regulatory relief measures. Governor Gavin Newsom and the mentioned state departments only have one intention in mind, and that is to bail out the alcohol industry. How many more lives are they willing to sacrifice to satisfy their alcohol industry political donors? The governor himself built his fortune on selling alcohol. The buck stops at Governor Newsom. The Alcohol Beverage Control Department and the Public Health Department are under his jurisdiction. The California Alcohol Policy Alliance refuses to allow alcohol regulation to become the new normal. We demand that the regulatory relief measures be taken back. We ask for a temporary closure of all alcohol establishments that put lives at risk. And more importantly, we ask for all alcohol COVID-19 response be based on science 
not profits. Alcohol sales are not essential. Lives are essential. Thank you. Gilbert Mora from CAPA, California Alcohol Policy Alliance. I just want to read a quick quote uh, that came on Facebook. The ability to obtain alcohol during COVID is despicable. Selling to minors is not the answer, nor is opening bars. Now, um, we have a brief clip from Will Jones III of SAM, that smart approaches to marijuana in Washington, DC. Hi, my name is Will Jones. I'm the communications and outreach associate for the organization Smart Approaches to Marijuana. I'm also a husband, father, firefighter, and community activist in Washington, DC. I tell people all the time when I walk out the front door of my house in any direction, the first store that I get to is a liquor store. I can go a little bit farther and get to a convenience store, but that store will be so plastered with advertisements for tobacco, alcohol, and the lottery that I can't even see inside the windows of that store. A study out of John Hopkins showed that there are eight times as many liquor stores in some communities of color as other communities. Unfortunately, in 2020, this is still a reality for millions of people in communities like mine across the country. But what we're seeing is that in the midst of a worldwide pandemic, that these addiction for profit industries have successfully lobbied to have their businesses deemed essential and they're seeing record profits during this time. We need to hold these industries accountable and not allow them to continue to exploit vulnerable and disadvantaged communities and harm public health. That was uh, Will Jones III of SAM, Smart Approaches to Marijuana. Now we will hear very quickly from several advocates around the country concerned about the mix of alcohol and COVID and the need to roll back deregulation. Our first very brief speaker is Don Ziegler, PhD. He is, the he is the adjunct associate professor at Chicago School of Public Health. Hi, Bruce and colleagues. Uh, yes, I am uh, Don Ziegler, uh, a doctorate in, in public health, and I'm in the faculty of the School of Public Health at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And before retiring, I was uh, the director of prevention and healthy lifestyles at the American Medical Association. Fortunately, here in Illinois, we have aggressive COVID-19 policies overall, and we have not yet seen the more drastic measures to open up alcohol availability as have California and Ohio. However, Illinois has responded to business pressures with some potentially detrimental decisions. For example, all licensed retailers in Illinois, including those with licenses for only serving alcohol on their premises, are now authorized to conduct package sales, to-go sales, and, uh, and, uh, um, uh, including uh, uh, mixed drinks and cocktails, curbside deliveries, home residential deliveries, and any other similar sales or delivery, albeit intended to help businesses while maintaining social distancing during the pandemic. The state considers these measures temporary deliveries. Well, we'll see how long or how temporary they really are. We are concerned that what supports the economy in the short term may actually become the new normal and that the result will be increased alcohol consumption that evidence indicates will contribute to undesirable long-term health issues and have many negative social implications in Illinois. So we must be careful. Thank you. Hi, my name is Barry Schmidt. I'm from Bay City, Michigan, and I am the coordinator of the Bay County Prevention Network and co-chair of the Michigan Coalition Reduce Underage Drinking. With alcohol deregulation comes increased access, and with that increased problems, as was discussed earlier by Dr. Greenfield. In an attempt to help Michigan alcohol establishment, legislators enacted deregulation policy, such as cocktails to go in social districts. And cocktails to go, some businesses have taken it so far to offer booze in a bag. The question becomes that, are cocktails to go the new juice box for adults? 
we urge our Governor Whitmer and our legislator from the great state of Michigan to put public health first and not let a temporary fix of helping these businesses become a permanent problem. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jeff Hanley, Executive Director of the Commonwealth Prevention Alliance of Pennsylvania, a statewide nonprofit that supports organi organizations and coalitions across the state to prevent substance misuse. During the pandemic, Pennsylvania has enacted alcohol policies with the potential to affect the public health of our communities, including the temporary sale of cocktails to go from bars, restaurants, or hotels with a liquor license. Some regulations on bars and restaurants have been imposed to only serve alcohol with a meal, which is defined as breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Pennsylvania is currently an alcohol beverage control state with wine and spirits to be sold only in the state owned stores. COVID however, has opened the door for legislative discussions on the privatization of alcohol sales. We need to continue to support the controlled state model in Pennsylvania and the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board with their excellent jobs, benefits and community prevention efforts. Alcohol consumption can increase during stressful times and may be mistaken as coping. During the pandemic, there are added factors of job loss, reduced income, youth education, and easy access to alcohol that is likely intensifying those factors and leading to misuse. The need for prevention and public health is now. Thank you. Thank you. That was Jeff Hanley from Pennsylvania. We also heard from Don Ziegler from Illinois and Barry Schmidt from Michigan. As you can see, Many, many states and communities are seeing that reopening bars too quickly causes the spread of the coronavirus and spikes in COVID cases. Deregulating bar service with to-go cocktails, street sales of alcohol, and loose home delivery has its own dangers to public health. This is a confusing and scary time, but evidence-based strategies to control the spread of coronavirus are needed not scattershot deregulation of tested alcohol controls. We had a comment on Facebook from Sandy Logan, public health first over money. Communities can take action. Our governors throughout the country have tremendous powers to shut down bars, to reopen bars, and to decide which deregulation measures stay in place and which are lifted. We ask that community leaders and health advocates take action today with their own governor by texting the word regulate to 313131 on your smartphones. We now have eight minutes for questions from the press or from the public. Um, let me read a, a question here. Um, this is addressed to JP Dorval. Does your group find issue with the executive orders since some of the measures in these bills overlap with the orders signed by Ohio's governor early in this pandemic? JP? Awesome, thank you, Bruce, for the question. I, I love questions like this. Um, the difference between the governor's executive orders and this legislation is pretty simple. Uh, when the governor set out to you know, create cocktails to, to go, it was on a temporary basis. You know, the executive orders, they have an end date. Uh, the legislation that's currently uh, being considered by our General Assembly does not, and that is where our problem lies. Uh, going back to my, my comments, we understand uh, that COVID-19 has brought up a bunch of challenges for our local businesses, our restaurants, and our bars. We get that. Um, and we get that, you know, temporary measures to help, you know, pick them back up are necessary for some. Um, but what we don't understand is why but now they're es porque ahora para que ese tipo de regulaciones sean permanentes o sea hey, you know when covid is all said and done and you have these uh, measures continuing to go forward like cocktails to go and things of that nature you know what are we necessarily addressing i mean you're you're you're, you're not addressing anything if the pandemic is over and you know now you just have cocktails to go and, and all those other deregulatory measures um, just codified in our law so that's what we're fighting back against we're not fighting back against the, the temporary executive orders if the General Assembly wants to put sunsets on some of these measures, that's fine with us. 
but it's the long lasting uh, additions to uh, alcohol liquor laws or deregulations to alcohol liquor law that we have an issue with. Thank you, JP. Uh, the, the next question, if I can find it, there it is, uh, is for Linda Bosma uh, of Minnesota. Linda, you said you work with community coalitions. Can you explain just a little bit more about the makeup of these coalitions and the type of issues they work on? And do all states have such coalitions? Hi, Bruce. Thanks for that question. Um, every state uh, in the United States does have coalitions that work at either the local level or sometimes the statewide level. And these coalitions include, engage community stakeholders to reduce alcohol use and related problems. So a typical coalition is going to have representatives that include parents, schools, mental and physical health professionals, law enforcement, businesses, faith-based organizations, and more. Um, together, these groups generally use evidence-based strategies where they work to assess and identify alcohol issues that specifically impact their communities and then work to reduce access, over-service, and other alcohol-related problems such as over-concentration of outlets and violence. And um, so uh, I, I think the other thing that is challenging, a lot of these coalitions work at the local level. And so some of the some of the measures that have deregulated or relaxed regulations in on COVID are statewide policies that actually undo some of the hard work that's happened at the local level too. So that's an additional concern for us. Thank right, you. Thank, thanks, Linda. Um, I just want to read one quick comment from Facebook. Let's all work to repeal these delivery and takeout rules. They are dangerous to the health of our communities. Let's put public health as our priority. And remember, of course, the theme here is public health, not public drinking. I have a question for Gilbert Mora. Um, um, the question is, uh, bars are increasingly serving on sidewalks and streets. Um, what can the community do about that? And is there something that the governor can do to take action on that? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a very disheartening realization that uh, they're having these common areas. I mean, they, they've made, basically ABC has made it so that they're not enforcing their rules anymore. They're just allowing things to happen. And one of the things they're allowing is for bars and restaurants to spread their footprint even further onto streets and sidewalks and then use common areas together. And that's kind of disheartening because it's like, well, then who's responsible for the alcohol being served? We don't know. You know, uh, we had a story from San Diego that, yeah, they're giving one license to one bar and like three or four bars are going to use the common area. So if something happens, is that one bar on the hook for the thing? We need to address our local politicians and legislators and let them know that this is not acceptable. You know, you're, you're playing with fire when you do something like this, not only in the sense that, you know, it kind of muddies the water on how to regulate and enforce rule, uh, the law, but it also, you know, is a breeding ground for what we call the COVID virus. You know, you know it, with all these people standing next to each other, I mean, you can't drink with the mask on and it's kind of hard to talk with the mask on most of the time. So you know these people are interacting in a way that would definitely spread the virus with uh, social distancing not being practiced and you know not utilizing the mask in a meaningful way. So all right, we're, we're already talking with the governor. So yeah, we definitely need to talk to our governor about it too. Thank you, Gilbert. Um, great, we had some great panelists today. It was great. I mean, we heard from so many states um, and of course, there are many more who we would have liked to fit in. Um, I'm gonna wrap this up. That concludes our press conference. We wanna thank everyone who participated and helped make this happen. All our speakers are available for further questions as shown in our press release, which is now live. And contact information is in the press package available online at alcoholjustice.org. I'm Bruce Lee Livingston from Alcohol Justice signing off. Don't forget, to text REGULATE to 313131. Have a great day, stay safe, and don't let loose alcohol controls spread the coronavirus.